Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Femininja Project, and thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And of course, I have a fantastic guest with me today, and we're going to talk about relationships and emotional health and well-being. And you know how I am about emotions. I just don't like to admit I have them. So our guest's name is Alex Avila, and he is an author, speaker, counselor, founder, and owner of the Relationship Institute of the Rockies. And he is passionate about helping others build healthy relationships. He counsels individuals and couples. He has written three books and developed an online course, all which focus on helping his clients develop and nurture emotionally healthy relationships. Alex is also a renowned speaker who creates effective and meaningful presentations for a variety of audiences regarding relationships, mental health, emotional safety, and more. And he's going to tell us all about it. So Alex, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. You're welcome. And thank you, Cheryl, for inviting me. I'm looking forward to sharing with your community. It is an honor to have you here. And I would just like for you to start sharing your story of how you got into mental health in the first place and working with people and what brought you to really focusing on healthy relationships. Of course. Yes. I I didn't start out thinking at any time I was going to be a counselor. Sometimes as, as little kids, right? We think we're going to be a fireman or a police officer or something like that. I certainly wasn't thinking, you know, someday I'm going to work in mental health and help people with trauma and relationships and, and help prevent divorce. But um, so it didn't come to me until much later in life. Um, I, my first job and what I had for about 15 years was, was basically like in a retail environment, kind of moving up and management. And, um, and I decided after a while, like, this isn't really giving me life. And mm. so I, I just started to get curious about, you know, what else is there in me that, you know, any gifts, any strengths. And I started to have people kind of tell me about those. And sometimes I think that's where we we learn a lot about ourselves is when we have some trusted voices around us that are speaking life and, and seeing some of these things maybe that we don't see or we don't fully believe. So um, like a lot of counselors, I had people tell me, you know, you're easy to talk to or mm -hmm. you're a good listener or, you know, as I grew older and, you know, started to learn more, um, I was able to kind of encourage people and kind of, hey, what do you think about this and give them some advice. And I really enjoyed that. Um, being able to help people in that way. And um, I did that. And you know, when I was in management, I had you know, a lot of employees that were um, in like teenage or early 20s. And and I wasn't much older than they were at that mm -hmm. time. I was in my early 20s, but I, I thought, you know, kind of like a mentor role. I felt mm -hmm. like I could listen to some of the struggles that they had and help them, give them some direction and it just it felt good to be able to mm -hmm. make some kind of impact in that way. So it was mm -hmm. uh, an easy career change for me uh, in order to just get professional training and help people. And you know, a lot of I started out thinking that you know people will, I wanted to help couples, and I thought, well, I want to see premarital couples. I want to help mm -hmm. people with relationships. And a lot of people don't go to counseling until there's something really you know, difficult going on, struggles and crisis. So of mm -hmm. course I had to get training um, in how to help people with trauma and different relationship uh, issues that were just very difficult to overcome on their own. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that I know you specialize in, and I didn't, you know, run through them all uh, during the introduction, but betrayal is a really mm -hmm. huge area that you you focus on. It is. Yeah. I, when I started seeing couples, um, a lot of people were coming in to me uh, to see me because of infidelity, because of mm -hmm. um, breaking trust in the relationship and it just broke my heart. Um, I was surrounded by a divorce growing up and everybody around me seemed to be having struggles in relationships. That was another thing that just kind of, I think, activated my, my heart to be able to help mm -hmm. people in this area. So um, yeah, I decided to get more training and helping people with betrayal. Uh, there's there's a such thing called betrayal trauma. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And um, it looks a lot like PTSD. A lot of the research has shown that over the last several years. Mm -hmm. A lot of the unwanted or intrusive thoughts and overwhelming feelings that can be attached to someone that you love who has betrayed you. So mm -hmm. um, I've enjoyed helping couples work through some of that, definitely to understand and, and slow down and just park on that thought for a while of the hurt, the pain mm -hmm. that was caused and making sure both partners understand before they try to move too quickly through something like that, or just mm -hmm. kind of give the idea of get over it, you know, and just not being compassionate and, mm -hmm. and active in the trust rebuilding process. So when you're talking about that type of betrayal, you're really talking about, um, you know, sexual betrayal, intimacy. Uh, there's other types of betrayal with a partner. Uh, I, I believe like if you're not in a situation where you feel like your partner isn't really fully supporting you or even just abandoning you in, in a time of need, um, do you actually ever deal with people like that or couples who have that going on? Definitely. There could be many different types of betrayal, uh, financial for one, right? If somebody oh. is hiding money or they're mm -hmm. spending money, um, somebody has a secret account or mm -hmm. um, they're just not being trustworthy. So, so anytime that we have to hide something, anytime mm -hmm. that we can't tell our partner and, you know, we sometimes don't feel emotionally safe to do so because we fear some kind of reaction, but anytime we avoid or minimize or, you know, just, mm -hmm hide something like that and there are secrets involved um, that hurts i think mm -hmm. a lot of people when they get into relationship they just believe you know we're going to be able to put everything on the table and we're going to be able to share our hearts mm -hmm. with each other and hopefully take care of each other be tender uh, mm -hmm. with each other but um, life happens sometimes and we mm -hmm. get busy with other things and we just mm -hmm. kind of you know forget that you know the, the partner we fell in love with we need to cherish them we need mm -hmm. to be honest and forthcoming and open. And um, part of what I like to do is just help couples. Um, and when I work with individuals as well, identify all those blocks or barriers, you know, what mm -hmm. gets in the way of you sharing deeply mm -hmm. with this person, you know, mm -hmm. basically it's a different way sometimes than asking, why are you hiding this? But you know, what, <laughs> you know, what, what, yeah, why? I think that's a, a much more compassionate uh, way of starting a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just to be curious, um, around that. And I, I want to help people also be curious with each other and, mm -hmm. and see how did that happen? Why did we start doing these things? Because mm -hmm. sometimes we do them for a long time and don't realize the pain mm -hmm. and distance we're creating uh, until we slow down, look at that and talk about it in a different way. I would imagine even trying to unravel all of that would be very difficult at first because it's almost like a Pandora's box. You know, you have this little, um, let's just call it an infidelity or betrayal or a little white lie. And then it leads to something else and something bigger and something deeper. So, I mean, just at the very beginning of trying to work through that um, as a couple, I mean, I, I would imagine it would be incredibly difficult. So how do you support them, you know, through that process so they could understand that what they're experiencing is, normal and that they have to kind of go through that to get to the other side? That's a great question. I, I think that's one big thing that I like to have people understand is, is that it is very normal to mm -hmm. protect ourselves to even so to do the behavior part of this is to withhold and, and it's protection. We're trying to protect mm -hmm. ourselves and it's, I think we only feel vulnerable and take risks to the degree we feel safe with someone. So mm -hmm. uh, for whatever that is, whatever reasons we we stop sharing whatever reasons mm -hmm. we withhold a lot of times we've learned that growing up so mm -hmm. i really like to help people understand and, and normalize that for them if you didn't learn how to communicate deeply to take risks to mm -hmm. show emotion mm -hmm. i think that's true for a lot of us if we didn't have good models growing up parents or caregivers or other people and we were quieted right we were told just be quiet or mm -hmm. um, get over it or you know mm -hmm. man up that kind of stuff we're we're putting our guard up and mm -hmm. we need to it's very protective it's in it's putting us in survival mode so we need to do that but sometimes we keep that for the rest of our lives right until we mm -hmm. know different we just mm -hmm. keep our walls up um, so when i'm meeting with somebody who they're coming in for a presenting problem. Like, here's mm -hmm. what's going on. Here's what we need help with. And if it's infidelity and betrayal, 
um, we have to peel back some of the layers, right? And and we have to, as best as we can, try to sort out or separate, okay, this is what was going on in your marriage long before the betrayal, or sometimes parallel with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's difficult because all of a sudden, all the pain is on the table, all the hurt, all the mm-hmm. questioning, you know, what was real in our marriage or relationship all these years. Um, but we're also now seeing some of the the ways they handle conflict and that those disagreements, those differences, mm-hmm. personality differences and approaches, all those things are now on the table. And it just, mm-hmm. as you might imagine, become overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And I think it's fascinating that, um, you know, you brought up the, the growing up years and the role models. And, you know, we have a tendency to repeat, you know, what we see. And, you know, as a baby boomer, the generation where I was growing up, you, man up was definitely the word. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, don't show your emotions, you know, especially if you're a, a, a guy or a man, you have mm-hmm. to be really strong. You have to be you know, the the protector, you have to be very resilient. And you never knew what was really going on underneath that facade, or that veneer of strength or that armor that was protecting the men around you. Exactly. I think particularly for men, but I think, you know, everybody growing up, you know, if we mm-hmm. haven't been able to ask for help, and we haven't mm-hmm. been met with any kind of care or compassion and, and people that mm-hmm. would actually take a step toward us to help meet our needs or soothe us, Mm-hmm. We're going to go other places. We're, we're first going to try to shut that part of us off mm-hmm. to protect ourselves, but we go other places to soothe ourselves and to get those needs met. And that's where a lot of actually addictions can happen mm-hmm. because we're looking uh, for some kind of meaning. We're looking to find out, you know, do I matter? And mm-hmm. it can be very difficult. So I, I think sometimes, you know, for men, we're, we're told, you know, to, to be strong, to, not show emotions, don't cry, you know, mm-hmm. so I, I've been very encouraged uh, to see this over the last few years, especially um, how more men are you know, being vocal and using mm-hmm. their platforms to say, hey, we're men, too, we're human, and mm-hmm. we have emotions, and we need to be able to have a safe place, a safe person to mm-hmm. share those normal human emotions of sadness, of fear, mm-hmm. um, inadequacy, and a lot of times that might show up with um, comparison in the workplace mm-hmm. or performance in other places, sports or whatever else. But um, it can feel very lonely because we can't share that and we mm-hmm. don't have anybody that will hear us and comfort mm-hmm. us and not judge us. I always like to say that men are people too. Um <laughs> And I Mm -hmm. have a very soft spot in my heart for guys because I think there's way too much man bashing going on out Mm -hmm. there. And I personally wouldn't be where I am today if it were not for the support of the many men in my life that, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, that I met actually some of them later in life. Um, But yeah, and so it's, I'm really happy to see that things have really turned around, especially in the area of mental health, that people can, um, you know, talk about it openly when they're having problems, especially men, that it's not a weakness, it's just being human. Yeah, it takes great strength and tremendous courage to be able to share something vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And and I feel that's, you know, the biggest thing we can do uh, for Mm -hmm. ourselves in our relationship is to be real and to, to seek being authentic. Um, Mm -hmm. We're being true to ourselves when we can share our feelings. Mm -hmm. Uh, First, we have to identify them. If if we haven't, we don't know what they are. Sometimes it's just, you know, you can be mad, sad, or glad, you know, Mm -hmm. there are thousands of other emotional states we can have. Sometimes Mm -hmm. we feel many of those in in any given hour, but Mm -hmm. if we can really identify what we're feeling, allow ourselves Mm -hmm. to experience it and then express it, share it with other people, that's Mm going to build a bridge to connection and and depth Mm -hmm. and intimacy. So we're talking about couples counseling and you also, um, counsel individuals, work with people one-on-one. And I just want to go back then to the word that you used, addiction. That's, you know, where addictions come Mm -hmm. from. And one of the, another area of expertise that you have is sexual addiction. So I'm kind of guessing that would be like the individual counseling. It is. Yeah. How do you work with people who are going through that and what causes it in the first place? Right. So there can be a lot of things, as I was mentioning about, you know, we go to soothe ourselves 
And mm -hmm. if we don't feel like we have a place to go to, we don't have a, a place, a safe person to talk mm -hmm. to. Um, I, if I didn't, I didn't have a father that I could go to and share and ask questions to, I, you know, I think maybe a lot of us have, we know immediately, naturally, can I go mm -hmm. to this person or not? Mm -hmm. And I had one that would just shut down that, and I would be even punished for bringing up questions, you know, about sex or different things that I think you're just natural and, mm -hmm. and normal and curious uh, for kids to have. Uh, why can't we talk about sex? Like we could talk about anything else. So mm -hmm. there's kind of shame that can build with that. You know, if we can't talk about this. So I think for a lot of people early on, if, if they don't have a place, they can bring up this normal human experience and these mm -hmm. feelings of sex um, and we're sexual beings right from mm -hmm. from the start that's just a part of our makeup and who we are and and something that we learn later on brings pleasure and and it can be something shared that really can build you know emotional intimacy so if we don't have a place to go to that again begins to build shame mm -hmm. and we put walls up um, so we can't share um, so when people try to go to people naturally growing up and they can't, they start to seek out validation from others. A lot of times mm -hmm. we're seeking the answer to the question, do I matter? Mm -hmm. You know, and what is good about me and what is valuable about me? And uh, if we don't get those answers from either a parent, a friend, you know, a, a good aunt or uncle or teacher or coach or mm -hmm. someone that believes in us, we begin to feel it's traumatizing right? we begin to feel like we don't fit in mm -hmm. that's where a lot of us begin questioning ourselves uh, i think there's a normal human development part of that anyway and as we're a teenager um, as we're comparing ourselves but mm -hmm. if we don't feel we measure up um that's very painful you know, it's overwhelming it's unbearable so mm -hmm. so we need some kind of soothing and you know, people have used the word self-medicate even with like alcohol or drugs and mm -hmm. other things where we're looking to escape. So we, we can't sit with ourselves ourselves with our feelings. You know, mm -hmm. these beliefs can be overwhelming. We kind of get into these spirals sometimes and beat ourselves up. So, so we're looking to escape. And so a lot of times that, that can be sex, right? There's pleasure in that. And mm -hmm. again, if you add shame and secrecy to a normal human thing, it, it starts to have us feel very isolated. Uh, so if you think about the, so commonly the, the nine-year-old boy um, is curious about some of these things and, mm -hmm. and maybe he discovers, you know, somebody's pornography collection, or a lot of times that's the story. It's they found dad's magazine, you know, now it's mm -hmm. the internet, of course, but um, they found this and they were excited like oh i never saw this before we're not supposed to see this but they can't just go hey dad what's this and so they they learn from a young age what they can and cannot do but it's also confusing because they feel you know some excitement some pleasure some you know taboo type uh, thing is going on um mm -hmm. so they they hide it but it it becomes something that they enjoy and they go back to and mm -hmm. And it just develops from there. Um, so a lot of research around um, sexual compulsivity and and these types of behaviors uh, will will parallel what it's like to have a drug addiction. And, mm -hmm. and some people in the research has said, said it's is difficult to quit heroin. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's as difficult to quit nicotine and different things because their brain is changing. Mm -hmm. Everything is telling them this feels good. Again, but the shame is wrapped in there. So it, it, it's secret, but it grows and it just gets out of control. And, you know, sometimes 30, 40 years later, people wow. are realizing this has been a part of my entire life um, that they can recall. And, and it's caused me problems. So, mm -hmm. you know, not only at the expense, we always look at, again, what gets in the way um, <clears throat> and how it's a problem. And it's a problem because maybe I missed work, maybe I lost a job because of this. Mm -hmm. And certainly, um, if it wasn't something that they talked about was okay in the relationship, you know, mm -hmm. the secrecy around sexual behaviors can really cause a lot of harm, a lot of emotional mm -hmm. betrayal. And you mentioned even like the young boy finding the, the pornographic magazine, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you did briefly mention that, of course, now there's the internet, and mm -hmm. that is a huge, huge problem. 
in our society because it is available online. And I did an interview, oh my gosh, probably two, maybe three years ago with a friend and colleague of yours, Claudia Hawley. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was about uh, keeping our children safe online from online predators. So it just seems to be so prevalent and it terrifies me just as a human being. You know, I don't have children or grandchildren of my own, but it just mm. really concerns me about how vulnerable, you know, especially young people are, and especially if they are really curious and their parents haven't talked to them or they don't have an adult role model to kind of mentor them and carry them through this, this time of curiosity and confusion. It's just like a tragedy waiting to happen. It is. And it is is overwhelmingly sad because it's it's right there. We have the accessibility, you know, it's anonymous and um, there's no end to it. So mm -hmm. it's always on 24 hours, right? But, you know, back when people were looking for pornography magazines, like they had to go to you know, a truck stop or the store and it was mm -hmm. almost a shameful experience. But now it's anybody can access it. So yeah, young mm -hmm. kids, you know, as young as three can see this or younger. I mean, they just have an iPad that's not protected. A Ugh. lot of times little kids innocently stumble across this, right? It's just there. It's really mm -hmm. everywhere. You might not think it's in, you know, every social media app, you can basically find it. Mm -hmm. um, so even when they're not looking for it or a friend mm -hmm. will share it with them, um, young kids are going to be exposed. So as parents and grandparents and anybody just to be able to educate other, other parents about this is there, like they're going to find it and it's going to find them. So making sure they have enough, the monitoring, the filtering <clears throat> software is, is very, very important just for their, their safety and well being, And there are just some things that they can't unsee after they've been exposed to. Right. And thank you for bringing that up because it's one of those things that really bothers me and I don't know why, but especially like if I go out to, to lunch or I'm at a restaurant or a coffee shop or whatever, and if I see a parent with a small child and one of the things they do is first thing is they hand them a device to entertain mm -hmm. the child, you know, while they're talking to their friend or they're talking on their own phone, you know, and it just really breaks my heart that they're not engaging with their child. But what really mm -hmm. bothers me is somebody's watching, you know, whether it be mm -hmm. online or even across the room in the coffee shop and seeing that that parent and child really aren't engaging, which mm -hmm. in my mind makes the child an easy target. Wow, it does. Yeah, if they're not connected. So you know, there's this, a lot of growing research and uh, interest in attachment mm -hmm. over the last few decades. And you know, we need to have this attachment, was, which basically is a bond. It's a bond with our kids, with our friends, with mm -hmm. a romantic partner or spouse, and anytime we we escape that or we find an alternative to that, we have to stay aware of the impact. So mm -hmm. first is the human connection. We want to be able to connect with someone because even little kids are getting that feedback in real time of, do I matter? And does, does mm -hmm. my mom, my dad want to spend time with me? Um, or am I a burden? Am I mm -hmm. just, you know, and, and maybe it's not every time that a parent will hand over a device, but it's if that's the default and if they mm -hmm. feel like I want to connect naturally, kids are thinking that with my parent mm -hmm. and I can't, I, I don't see their eyes. I don't mm -hmm. have this bonding attachment, allowing my neurons to dance literally mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm looking at somebody who's smiling at me. We're missing out on these strong, necessary human attachments that actually can be the opposite of addiction because we can get attached to anything that can become an addiction. But if we have healthy attachments with humans and that really helps, that's what we really desire naturally, mm -hmm. I believe. So when we have that, we're not going to going to go down this other path that is mm -hmm. really a, a false, a pseudo intimacy. And mm -hmm. we don't feel good about um, mm -hmm. social media, you know, whatever we're giving our attention to and using more than we, we know we should. Mm -hmm. you know, that can be an addiction. 
So I absolutely loved that phrase, allowing our neurons to dance. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That just really resonated with mm -hmm. me. And I can see the dancing neurons. It's just as a dancer <laughs> and somebody who loves neurology. Um, yeah, that really just spoke to me. So thank you for that little tidbit. You're welcome. I like that too. We need to animate that somehow, right? Make the dancing neurons. Well, that's exactly what I was thinking is doing, you know, a little graphic. I've got so many different mm -hmm. pictures of neurons and brain cells and all this <laughs> stuff and, you know, having them dance, I think it would be really, uh, you know, uh, pretty impactful. Right. Happy neurons, happy dance. <laughs> that's right. So now when did you decide to open up your own practice? And I love the name of it, the Relationship Institute of the Rockies. Mm -hmm. So when did that happen in your training? How did that come about? Yes, I always um, enjoyed management and business, and and I I went to college um, ten years. <clears throat> excuse me, I I tell people I take ten years off after high school to go to college, and I don't recommend that. Mm -hmm. um, but that there's sometimes a lot of shame because we're not doing it the way we're hearing we're supposed to do it. But I was you know a different career path, and <clears throat> I enjoyed talking with people and like I mentioned, helping and encouraging and mentoring younger people. So that was always kind of in my mind. And then mm -hmm. doing counseling training um, in my undergrad and um, grad school and knowing I was going to blend those two together. And it, it just, all that came naturally to me uh, to be able to just launch a business and and know those aspects, you know, behind the scenes. So, so I launched that because uh, Relationship Institute of the Rockies, uh, the idea of that um, in about 2012 was kind of when the idea came up was a lot of people would go to a class, they'd go to a workshop, but they might not go to therapy. Mm. Um, again, the, the stigma, it's getting better now, but the stigma was really bad um, around mm -hmm. that time, you know, 10 years ago of, of, you know, would I, I don't need help, you know, a lot of cultural reasons and pride mm -hmm. sometimes, but you know, the other barriers cost and, um, maybe bad experiences with counselors mm -hmm. before. So it's like they would not go. Mm -hmm. But I did these workshop uh, shops for about 10 years, these in-person two-day couples workshops uh, that were very impactful for uh, guys, uh, especially, but um, couples that would go in and finally feel, hey, I'm, nothing's wrong with me. I, I just didn't learn how to connect mm -hmm. growing up. I didn't learn about intimacy and relationship education. So I wanted to bring education to people and help them just get the ball rolling. Maybe they'd be open to going to counseling and getting more help if they experience some hope um, through some of the tools and just learning that, you know, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. If you grew up this way, you had to unlearn. A lot of us have to unlearn what we've learned growing up the first 18 years of our life. So we um, can now learn new things. So um, that that's the the vision behind that. And then, mm -hmm. of course, that's my um, practice, my private practice, where I offer therapy and workshops, and I do um, a few men's sexual recovery groups each week, mm -hmm. um, and speaking and, and just different engagements go through uh, Relationship Institute of the Rockies. I love the way that you were talking about learning and unlearning, you know, like unlearning the the, the bad stuff or, or the, the patterns and the habits to really learn or to have new patterns mm -hmm. come in. And to me, that's really important. If you can touch on that just a little bit more, because from like a neurological standpoint, you know, if you can just explain what happens in the mm -hmm. brain when you've got these patterns and habits and how you can interrupt them and create new habits and patterns and ways of thinking and moving and living and sensing. So I just think that people don't really understand it's like, well, I've got this habit and it's bad and I've got to change it. But it's actually a really beautiful physiological mm -hmm. gift. Uh, I call it the nature's miracle that we have deep inside our brain that can actually help us change. So if you want to touch on that, I'd really appreciate it. Certainly. And I'll maybe share a little bit of my story for about a minute here. But um, I think when we grow up, we, we we're looking to our parents for love and connection and support. Uh, you know, as an infant, right? We're looking at eyes and you look at babies that smile after, you know, sometimes several months of, of life, they're looking back and they're giving you that, you know, reciprocal love mm -hmm. um, through the facial expressions. It, it really starts to set us off on a good path, right? So when we don't get that, uh, we are looking for that, as I mentioned earlier. So, so my, I feel like my, my father was very abusive in many ways. And I, mm -hmm. I was just thinking about this, like he abused my spirit, you mm -hmm. know, so 
through just not believing me and saying, you know, very mean, cruel things and, and his physical behaviors and all of that mm -hmm. um, was implanting in me insecurity mm -hmm. and jealousy. Um, I saw that come out in my relationships. You know, I started to um, date in, in middle school, high school, and I was very jealous because I, I wanted somebody to stay. Like I was reenacting what I didn't get and what I wanted from my father. So a lot of, you know, as we, we think about and talk about a lot of things that we deal with and struggle with as an adult come from our experiences as a child. And um, I was, I realized I was looking to humans to fill a gap that they were not designed to fill. Mm. Um, I was looking for someone, you know, at that time, a dating partner to, to help me feel secure. I didn't know it back then, but mm -hmm. it came out as, you know, I was insecure. I was jealous. Um, mm -hmm. It came across as controlling behavior. Mm -hmm. And because I wanted to know that I was enough, I wanted to know that somebody would be there and, and stay there. And so I think I was looking for that uh, throughout my life. So I had to discover that it took me a long time and I had to make a lot of mistakes, but mm -hmm. I had to discover that um, I, I am enough as mm -hmm. an individual. And I had to hear that from other people that I trusted that knew me mm -hmm. and believed in me and were safe people. And I started to believe that more. And it wasn't really until my early mid twenties where I started to really feel confident and secure. So looking mm -hmm. back, um, thankfully I had a, a lovely supportive nurturing mother that was just constant, stable, safe person mm -hmm. um, that was able to help me feel enough um, that I could believe in myself, but still, I think the individual struggles we have and where our thoughts can go um, mm -hmm. was was pretty dark for quite a while. So I, mm -hmm. looking back, was able to to see where I was looking legitimately for love, and mm -hmm. I was just trying to unlearn the patterns, unlearn the behaviors that I'd naturally I think I went to in order mm -hmm. to be good enough, in order to be seen and appreciated and valued as a mm -hmm. human and not just because of performance, not because mm -hmm. of all these behavioral things, but just who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. That and That's another thing that just really jumped out at me that you said that he was abusing your spirit mm -hmm. because that's such an important part of who we are and how we react to different things. And I think sometimes people don't realize that it's not just, you know, the, the mental um, abuse and the emotional abuse. It's basically, basically gets down to the very core of our existence. Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen, you know, of course, through my martial arts training, mm -hmm. um, people's spirit, actually, you could just see it just shrink mm -hmm. and shrivel. And it's almost like they deflate right in front of your eyes. And that's really something that's difficult to get back and to grow and develop. It is. Yeah. I, I think it does. It touches on our meaning and how people relate to us and see us and treat us. Um, mm -hmm. it, it affects our, our meaning sometimes why we're here, our purpose, mm -hmm. why we're doing. So you know, when I started to look at that and started to get into the counseling field, mm -hmm. you know, my purpose came alive, right? I, mm -hmm. my, my gifts, my strengths, my talents, um, those were something that were good that people saw value in. And I was making, I believe a difference. So I, I, I begin to become alive and feel like, okay, I'm made for more and mm -hmm. I'm not just going to be stuck in a job or I fell into that job. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to create my path. Um, so I, I just say, you know, we can start over at any time, right? We could take a sharp turn, even mm -hmm. if it feels like a setback immediately um, or will require a lot of time or energy if we go back to school or if we start mm -hmm. a, a different career change or we just start to bring in some things that give us life. Mm -hmm. um, or build relationships with safe people, um, that can happen. And, and even if we've been mistreated, even if we feel like we're trapped in these types of relationships or attract these types of people, we can start over at mm -hmm. any time and we can you know, be able to find the value and protect that with solid boundaries. Mm -hmm. So people can't penetrate that. People can't um, have access to our heart unless we give mm -hmm. that to them. It almost sounds as though you're helping people develop better relationships with themselves. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's where we start. And mm -hmm. if we know who we are and mm -hmm. our, we know our value 
and we can protect that, we will, we naturally only let people in again to the degree we feel safe. But if we really know our boundaries and, mm -hmm. and our boundaries are much more about just saying no um, <laughs> or keeping people out, it's mm -hmm. valuing ourselves. It's knowing ourselves. And when we can do that um, again through protection, not just putting our walls up and keeping people mm -hmm. out, but being real about, and that's what I put in my latest book, Emotional Safety, was really giving them a plan of how do you let people in and, and where do you keep them? I use the 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 picture of you know, we keep some people at the gate. You know, some mm -hmm. people will jump over the gate. They're they're kind of unwelcome or they're just there um in our yard after they get in our gate. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can invite people onto our porch and ultimately mm -hmm. to our table in our mm -hmm. safe inner circle. Those people are at our table. They know mm -hmm. everything they're, they care for us. We can depend on them. We know they'll be there for us. They don't judge us. So those people and, and how we interact with them and give feedback to each other back and forth through our words mm -hmm. and our, um, nonverbal behaviors and mostly consistent, you know, getting together and, and sharing life, mm -hmm. we start to value ourselves because even if it's this one person that we can be safe with, uh, we start, we're valuing ourselves. Uh, it's just part of the subtitle of my book is honoring yourselves mm -hmm. while creating um, trust and presence in your relationships. So it's, it's needing to start with us. Mm -hmm. Well, two things I just wanted to bring up um, the power of no. Hmm. I learned how to say no when I was 50 and it was like, wow, this is just incredible. I mean, it was the, my entire life changed. And I know that sounds probably kind of sad, but when you think I was in caregiving type of situations, you know, um, as a medical person for, you know, a very long time, I started when at the age of 19. And of course I was always raised to put everybody else's needs above your own. That was the polite mm -hmm. thing to do. And it didn't always work all that well, but when I found out that I could say no, oh my goodness, it was like a choir of angels began to sing yeah. and the entire world <laughs> opened up. It was fantastic. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of self-empowerment that comes with that. And we need to give ourselves permission to be able to mm -hmm. say no. And sometimes a practical thing we can say is someone asks us to do something, you know, like, Oh, you know, that, that sounds like a good idea. Um, thank you for thinking of me. Let me think about that and I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. So let me think about that. I'll get back to you is a great way to, to honor yourself by saying, I need to process this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to look at my calendar because I already have a full week. Mm -hmm. And I might not always say no, but I might come back and say not yet or not mm -hmm. now. Um, but if we feel like we always have to say yes mm -hmm. to please people. And I did that early on. Again, when I started to to train as a counselor, because mm -hmm. like, I want to help people and I want to volunteer and I was over committing mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. um, I had to learn um, if I'm saying yes to this thing or this person, mm -hmm. then I'm saying no to this thing or this person. Mm -hmm. And as I was, um, getting married in college, I thought, okay, if I'm saying yes, even if it's a good thing, I'm volunteering mm -hmm. to help someone move. If someone mm -hmm. asked me for help and I'm, yes, I was the yes man. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm saying no to my new wife. I'm, mm -hmm. I can't be in two places at once, you know, mm -hmm. and, and even my energy level mm -hmm. after serving or helping someone else, I come back and I was tired or like, so we always have to put what I call the relationship or family filter any mm -hmm. opportunity, decision, anything that comes mm -hmm. our way, put it through the filter of mm -hmm. what matters most to you. Mm -hmm. How is it going to affect my most important person or people? Mm -hmm. And if it's if it's going to do that, I have to prioritize them. Mm -hmm. um, I might have to say no, and I'm going to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's going to feel very good to say no sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's another really important point that you brought up was um, being aware of your own energy level, like how going out mm -hmm. and helping other people, then you wouldn't have enough energy left for your wife or your home mm -hmm. life. And that's another really important thing that I think we need to pay attention to develop that sense of awareness, self-awareness. So we know and monitor our energy level, because if you can't, you know, if you're doing all these things, then you have nothing left to give for anybody else, including yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And, and 
balancing that out. So I think when we look at priorities, you know, if they're focused on, you know, sometimes we just have to step back and and really reflect on what do we do with our time and our money and our energy Mm -hmm. and, you know, on our deathbeds, we're not going to wish, I think people have said this before, we're not going to wish we've worked more, Mm -hmm. right? We want to know we've mattered. We want to be surrounded by people that, that love us, that have been there, that we have relationship with. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, spend time today to feed those and build those relationship bonds with people Mm -hmm. um, where are they going to be we're not going to be with anybody you know Mm -hmm. in our last breaths where so Mm -hmm. we developing those relationships you know with friends with family and and really feeling like we're feeling fulfilled Mm -hmm. not just you know every once in a while we feel good but every day we feel mm-hmm. like how we're expending our, our resources, our limited resources of time and energy and money, like mm-hmm. that shows where our, our priorities are. Mm-hmm. So tell us, Alex, how you became an author. When did you decide you were going to write your first book and how did that come about? And then I want you to talk about the books, give us the titles and, um, you know, anything that you want to talk about. Sure. So I... Uh, working as a couples therapist, um, I would hear from people sometimes that you know, we haven't had intimacy for months or even years in some cases. And and it began to bother me. Um, I think that's what we do and stuff bothers us, right? We write a book. But um, I, I was saying, no, you've had intimacy. You just didn't have sex. So mm-hmm. a lot of people equate the word intimacy mm-hmm. with sex, sexual intercourse. So mm-hmm. um, to be able to enjoy so many things on the pathway to the physical sexual acts um, is important. So I wanted people to pay attention to all these different ways they were connecting. And I Mm -hmm. was doing that in my own marriage and thought um, there are a lot of ways. Sometimes we know um, emotional intimacy. We might understand spiritual intimacy, but um, I started to pay attention. And over a period of two years, I came up with 40 different ways that we can feel either connected or disconnected in our primary romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wrote the book, 40 forms of intimacy and, Mm -hmm. and put a little inventory in there to help people kind of rank or, or gauge, like where, where do you feel close? Similar to like the five love languages Mm -hmm. uh, idea. Like, where do you feel close? Where do you want more connection? Um, What is maybe not so, you know, not reaching your heart. So if you could, identify that and share that with your romantic partner, um, then they have a pathway to your heart that works. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. one of them, for example, is food. You know, how do you feel intimacy with food? And so preparing, I thought, okay, when when my wife and I are thinking about what are we going to have to eat this week or tonight? And we're preparing food. Sometimes we cook together Mm -hmm. Um, um, or she would cook or I would cook. We would appreciate that. Um, and then we're eating together, right? We're sitting together um, around the table and, you know, we're talking or not even talking much, but we're there. And then mm-hmm. afterward, you know, if we're cleaning up um, and we noticed that when people would come over, if we'd have guests and we're hosting, like there's a lot of, you know, was a lot of scrambling <laughs> to clean and get everything ready, but we were doing it together mm-hmm. and we were enjoying time with other people as a couple. And then after they left, we're like, we're talking about it. Hey, that was great. And we're cleaning up together. Mm -hmm. So all those little connection points, Mm -hmm. I thought they count, they matter. Mm -hmm. Um, So food and who, a lot of people love food, right? So be able to enjoy a meal together, sit around Mm -hmm. the table, um, you know, whatever it is, coffee, tea, drinks, to be able to just share that those times together, I thought was Mm -hmm. enough. And again, there are 39 other ways beyond food. (laughs) <laughs> that couples can can connect in very practical ways. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Okay, so that was your first book, yes. and then you have the couples devotional. Yeah. So this builds um, from the forty forms of intimacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a smaller book. Uh, it's a devotional that allows people to do this once a day, once a week, if they want. Mm-hmm. And it, it was something that I thought. I wanted to write that even if one partner is going to work on the relationship and dedicate some time uh, to feeding and growing that relationship, that they could still make an impact um, Mm -hmm. if the other partner does not want to or isn't willing. So 
Um, that that idea is called the Three Thoughts Couples Devotional, and that is about um, focusing on me. You know, what do I have to do, and what are these things about me that I appreciate and um, and can celebrate, but then also my partner. What are the things that are important to him or her, and how mm-hmm. do I serve? What is one little thing I can do? Um, mm-hmm. And then God is the third part, and it mm-hmm. that's about you know how do we focus on God and what he's saying about this topic. So, Mm -hmm. so the book has 80 devotions. So it's the 40 forms of intimacy, each one of those topics twice. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's a short one page teaching on that topic, you know, like, Mm -hmm. um, again, emotional intimacy is one of them. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a brief teaching. It doesn't um, just replicate exactly what was in the 40 forms of intimacy book, but so it's different content. And then there's just three thoughts. So the three thoughts, very simple, Mm -hmm. concise, thinking about me, thinking about my partner, thinking about God in this, Mm -hmm. um, in this journey over this, you know, every week or every day that they go through that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then the third book, that's your newest one, right? Mm -hmm. The emotional safety. Yeah. So emotional safety, uh, that, that came out, you know, again, about a two year process of just paying attention to, you know, what, when do we feel safe and not? Um, and a lot of it, I believe overlaps with intimacy and closeness. Um, I wanted to write this where individuals and couples could benefit from mm-hmm. um, primarily being a couples therapist. I had to, I tried to keep it to one chapter. It was just focused only on you know, committed romantic relationships. Mm-hmm. And I believe the rest of the book can really apply to anybody. Um, mm-hmm. And I've had people or teenagers read it. I've had people that you know are not in a relationship who are in a relationship. Um, a lot of therapists um, that have given me really good feedback about the concept, because mm-hmm. I think we, we know a lot about that as, as therapists, we're trying mm-hmm. to create and be emotionally safe. Mm-hmm. and create that safe atmosphere for our clients. Um, so mm-hmm. we connect with them so they can share. Mm-hmm. And I wanted everybody, anybody to understand mm-hmm. what is emotional safety and what mm-hmm. does it look like? How can I be a safe person? Mm-hmm. And I use the word approachable as sometimes mm-hmm. a synonym that helps us understand what that means to be emotionally safe. If I'm approachable. Mm-hmm. People can come to me. They can share things with me. Mm-hmm. If I don't have time for them or mm-hmm. I dismiss them or I'm rolling my eyes, you know, all mm-hmm. these little things that are telling that other person, I can't share with you. I, mm-hmm. I can't approach you with this topic or even just ask, you know, for time with you. So I wanted to give people a very practical guide that helps them request safety from another mm-hmm. person. And, and I have a lot of self-reflection questions in there. And also questions you can ask another person, <clears throat> but mostly a, a guide of who is safe and, and who is unsafe as a person. Mm-hmm. And then I wanted to separate that out from who is an un, who's doing unsafe behaviors. Mm-hmm. Um, because but just because we're doing something that is, is not a, a good, positive, kind relationship behavior doesn't automatically make us an unsafe person. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wanted to be careful to distinguish that. But mm-hmm. Some unsafe people are those that they're not able or willing to look at the, how they're impacting other people, right? They mm-hmm. disregard boundaries. Um, they are quieting our voice. They are minimizing, mm-hmm. um, blaming us, gaslighting us. They're mm-hmm. not giving us room to share who we are and our hearts. So I wanted people to understand how and when they can protect themselves mm-hmm. without feeling guilty of mm-hmm. saying, you know, I just have to put up with this. Um, mm-hmm. Because even if we stay in a relationship where there's unsafe behaviors happening, we can still assert and enforce boundaries that are, again, valuing and honoring ourselves. Mm-hmm. Now, you actually do offer a free download of the first chapter. Is that correct? I do. Yes. Yeah. So if people go to my website, um, it's Alex A. Avila. Um, A-V-I-L-A dot com. They can um, click on that and get yeah, the first um, chapter of download. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's available on Amazon mm-hmm. um, on paperback and Kindle. And I am almost done recording the audiobook, So that should be coming out um, maybe February, 2023. 
Nice. Nice. And so both of the other books are available on Amazon as well, correct? Correct. Okay. And then you are also available for speaking. So if anybody in the audience would like to connect with you, they could reach out through your website. Is that right? Yes. Go to that same website and um, definitely do counseling, coaching, speaking, um, and consulting with other therapists. I, I offer services of trained therapists often and certifications. So um, really mm -hmm. stay active in the community of helping people um, build close, intimate, safe relationships. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, Alex, it has been an absolute delight having you on the show. I just loved listening to all of your words of wisdom and those little tips and pearls of wisdom that you interjected uh, into the conversation. So thank you very much for that. And just thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, Cheryl. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Do you have one final little pearl of wisdom, one last thing you would like to leave with the audience that they can kind of mull around in their brain for a while? Yeah, I would say we don't always have to look for the question of, do I matter? <clears throat> because you do matter. You know, so surround yourselves with people that know that, that see that, and go deeper with those people. Even if it's just one person, talk to them more um, invest in that relationship make time and honor yourself and everything that you say everything that you do uh, make sure that you're caring for your own soul your own yourself more than you are giving and giving and giving and and even maybe putting up with with behaviors and things that are creating you creating for you emotional pain mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. And thanks again for being on the show. You're very welcome. Thank you. And everybody, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. As always, please tell your friends and family about the show. Subscribe to it. Leave us a five-star review. I would really appreciate it. And do remember to cherish your relationships and really work on them. And one of the most important things to remember is to discover the power of no. It will change your life forever. And that is the way of the Femininja.